Hello everyone, how you guys doing? Welcome to our webinar and thank you for spending your time with us today. I'm Sun Kyu Lim, you can just call me Q. I'll be your host for today. Today's webinar, Concepts of Plastic Engine and Pushover Analysis with Mara Seville is presented by Angelo Tinga. He had worked in Arcadis and Smack previously and is currently working as a bridge engineer at WSP Manila. He's also very familiar with international standards, including the Australian, Middle East, British, and American, including the Philippines standards. With today's presentation, he's trying to provide a basic understanding of the concept of plastic engine and its importance. And in the second part, he gets you familiarized with the concepts and theories of pushover analysis. And in the final session, he'll provide the learning time of pushover analysis using Mataseville. Another thing to note, we Matasite just had a huge web convention in the Philippines on the 30th and 31st of March, which finished successfully. And out of the webinars conducted, we thought that this specific content would be very helpful and informative, so we decided to share it with you all. All right, let's start the webinar. Oh, by the way, during the webinar, if you have any questions about the content or what he's saying, just type it in the question box in the control panel. The speaker will answer your questions simultaneously since he's with us waiting to respond. You can also write your questions after the session and send them to us at MidasBridge at MidasIT.com. And if by any chance you miss some part of the webinar, We'll send out the link to the recorded version to your email and even the PPT material as well. All right. Thank you, guys. This is it for the introduction. And now we're going to get started. Enjoy the webinar. Hi, and good day to everyone. My name is Angela Tinga, and I will be presenting about the concepts of plastic hinging and pushover analysis with a short demonstration using Midas Civil. This will just be an introduction to the topics as we won't be able to discuss everything in detail. So I would like to thank everyone for joining me today and I am honored to be able to share with you my experiences. Before anything else, I'd like to present to you the goals of this presentation. First is to provide us an understanding of plastic hinges and its importance. Next for us to be familiarized with what is pushover analysis and its use. And lastly, to learn basic pushover analysis when we are using Midas Civil. Here is a summary of the topics that we will be discussing, which includes a short demonstration in conducting pushover analysis in Midas Civil at the latter part of this presentation. Let's talk about plastic hinging. What are plastic hinges? A plastic hinge is a section of an element where plastic bending occurs, which is developed when forces has surpassed the elastic capacity of the section. Note that plastic hinges are not true hinges. If we go back to our basic structural classes, we can remember that hinges will not transmit moments, which is not the case for plastic hinges. Plastic hinges will still have reasonable lateral resistance, but will continue to deform without any additional loads. To have a better understanding of plastic hinges, let's consider the simple SDOF model. We start with applying a lateral force on the structure, which will cause our structure to deflect a value of delta E. Note that deformations at this point is still reversible because we are still under elastic behavior. Ultimately, assuming the force is high enough, our structure will not be able to resist the lateral force reaching the collapse stage, wherein a section has exceeded usable capacity and there is a loss of lateral strength. But consider that between the elastic and collapse stages, our structure will still be able to retain lateral strength which can still accommodate a deflection equal to delta yi. But note that deformations at this point are not reversible. You may be asking, 
what is the purpose of plastic hinges? Isn't it bad to have permanent deformations in our structure? Or can it lead to a collapse? Well, the main use of plastic hinges in bridge design is to act as an energy damping device during large seismic events. Plastic hinges are part of the permitted earthquake elements in various design codes, which includes the DPWH BSDS that allows economical sizing and design of bridges. We allow repairable damage to our bridge, which should not lead to collapse. If you look to the idealized force versus displacement plot of a structure at the right side of the slide, we can see that we first have our elastic region. After, we then see considerable capacity after yielding and before collapse, which considers our plastic behavior. So, how are plastic hinges used in current bridge design? The common design approach in bridges is by having a ductile substructure with an essentially elastic superstructure. The term strong beam weak column may be more familiar to some of us. This approach requires the formation of plastic hinges in the column, which should be in easily inspectable areas in strong seismic events. These strong seismic events have a lower probability of occurrence, so it may be more economical to permit damage, plastic hinging, and repair rather than fully designing the bridge to resist all forces elastically. The force-based method is used by both AASHTO LRFD bridge design specifications and the DPWH LRFD bridge seismic design specifications. The method utilizes the response modification factors in its procedure. The force-based method permits the formation of the plastic hinges, ideally at the columns where the peak elastic force is reduced. In design, these reductions are produced by applying the response modification factors. The R factors are not magic factors that makes the seismic motion weaker. Simply, the R factors are a set of predetermined values which incorporate the inelastic response of a structure, factoring in ductility and redundancy. Prescriptive detailing, which refers to additional minimum transverse reinforcement or lateral support requirements for seismic events, ensure displacement and rotational capacity of the hinges, which we cannot directly check. As an example, here are the response modification factors from the DPWH TGCS Volume 5. Moving on, let's now talk about pushover analysis. Pushover analysis is a technique which a structure is subjected to incremental loads controlling either forces or displacements. As seen at the right, there are four main methods available when analyzing the responses of a structure subjected to seismic movements. The pushover analysis is a nonlinear static method of analysis that uses nonlinear techniques and considerations to assess the capacity of the structure. Note that Nonlinear static means the action is static, but the behavior is nonlinear. Next, it shows the approximate sequencing of cracks, yielding, and plastic hinge formation of the structure, which is not shown during elastic analysis. Lastly, pushover analysis is mainly a tool used in displacement-based method of seismic design. To better describe pushover on a structure, Consider the previous simple SDOF model and the force versus displacement plot on the screen. We then apply a lateral force F with a factor of 1, which causes displacement on our structure. Incrementally increasing our force will yield additional reversible displacement until we reach the point of first yield, where the plastic hinge is formed. From here on, the structure is free to displace without any additional increase in the force until the point of collapse is achieved. Pushover analysis allows us to go back to any of the states we've analyzed in order to observe forces, displacements, and reactions specific to that step. Now, we have to check, is pushover analysis right for you? First, 
are static nonlinear methods or displacement-based design permitted for your project? It is your responsibility to check compliance with the local codes of the project. Displacement-based design is a fairly new technology for bridges here in the Philippines. Next, do you have sufficient knowledge with nonlinear material properties and behavior? Sufficient knowledge is needed so that your structural model can accurately predict the performance of your bridge. Lastly, can the plastic hinges be pre-located or the failure mechanism pattern be predicted in your structure? If you answered yes to all of these, then pushover analysis may be right for you. We note that the pushover analysis, which is the actual procedure of incrementally pushing a structure, is a tool for conducting seismic design of a structure. For the entire procedure of confirming the fitness of a structure for use, there are two commonly known methods for bridges under the nonlinear static method category. First is the structure capacity or demand method, which is also known simply as the pushover method, and the capacity spectrum method, which involves the production of the capacity spectrum. For simplicity, we will only be discussing the simpler pushover method in this presentation. In its simplest form, the pushover method is a two-step analysis. First, we perform an elastic response spectrum analysis on our model in order to determine the displacement demand on the bridge. Note that other methods such as the elastic time history analysis are also valid. Next, we perform the pushover analysis to determine the displacement capacity of the bridge and arrive with a pushover curve. Having the values of both the demand displacement and displacement capacity, we can then determine if our design is sufficient, which we will be discussing more later. The overall flow of the pushover method is summarized in the chart shown. Uh, it goes without saying that the structural model at the start of the procedure should also satisfy other design requirements, such as the ultimate strength and service limit state. Additionally, the model should have already been designed versus moderate strength earthquakes, which are known as level 1 earthquakes in the DPWH standards. So, as discussed, assuming our model has satisfied all other design requirements, some additional items should also be considered. First, crack stiffness of the columns should be accurately checked. In the force-based method, it is usual and practical to assume that the crack inertia of the columns is 0.5 of the uncracked section. However, this may cause overestimation of the demand displacement for our structure. It is then preferred that we calculate the actual crack inertia of our columns. Next, we consider the nonlinear properties of the hinges, such as material strengths, concrete confinement, and other factors. Midas General Section Designer can help us with this input. Next, to determine the displacement demand, the most common procedure is to use an elastic response spectrum analysis. The displacement of the elastic system is approximately the same with that those of an elastoplastic system, except for short period structures. Short period structures are classified in design codes such as the AASHTO guide specifications for LRFD seismic bridge design, which depends on the ratio of the characteristic ground motion period and the fundamental period of the structure. As seen on the right, a factor to increase demand displacement is provided by the AASHTO guidelines. Next, we can then determine the displacement capacity of our structure by performing the actual pushover analysis. Some key limit states that we need to watch out for are first, the step where yielding first occurs, next, the step where there is slight damage and cracking, and then the step where moderate damage that is repairable occurs. Irreparable damages and structural collapse must also be taken note of, but design-wise, we will not be using these states.
with both demand displacement and displacement capacity known, we can then refer to our relevant design codes if our structure is structurally sound. An example, for the AASHTO guide specifications, the demand displacement and displacement capacity must just be simply compared. A higher capacity leads to a safe design. However, it should also be noted that there are other requirements such as member ductility requirements, as you can see here in the right side of the slide, which is taken from the AASHTO guidelines. Now, we will have to talk about the limitations of the pushover method. Pushover analysis assumes that our structure is predominantly governed by the first mode or in the lower modes of vibration. Consequently, a multiple degree of freedom system is reduced to an equivalent single degree of freedom system. Next, there is poor performance for irregular and unconventional bridges. Next, changes in the dynamic response is not considered as the structure softens. And lastly, nonlinear time history analysis, which is more rigorous, produces a more accurate result and can accommodate irregular and unconventional bridges. Now, let us see how we can perform a pushover analysis using Maida Seville. So, the steps in performing the pushover method starts with us by defining the pushover analysis model. What this means is that we just have a working elastic model that's already been verified against all other design requirements. Afterwards, we define our pushover global control settings. Next, we define our pushover load cases. Then, we define and assign our hinge properties. And afterwards, we interpret our results. So here I've already prepared my by the civil model. So note that the section sizes have already been checked for the serviceability and strength requirements, as well as the performance versus moderate strength earthquakes. So all of the normal modeling requirements are still applicable. In this model, I've also included stiffness scale factors to account for the cracking of the column. I am also using nonlinear soil springs, so I, I have defined force deformation functions. Masses are also defined because we will be using response spectrum analysis. I've also included my static loads and my response spectrum functions. So I've already gone ahead and completed the analysis for the structure. And one of the first things that we have to do is to check the structure's period. To do this, we go to the results tab and we can access it through the results tables and then clicking on vibration mode shape. So just click on OK and we will see the results for the structure where we can see the structure's dominant mode and its dominant period value. So now that we've determined the period of the structure, there are some important points that we have to consider. First, we have to check that the number of modes that we've specified will add up to at least 90% mass participation. 90% mass participation will ensure us that our response spectrum analysis will capture sufficient behavior of this bridge. Next, the structure or anything above the structure may be sensitive to excessive duration of shaking. So we have to check that our structure's period is within the allowable limits. So one of the railway projects that I've been previously involved with limited the period of the structure to less than two seconds. The reason for such was that the railway above the bridge was sensitive to excessive shaking. And last, we have to note the period at the dominant modes for each direction because we will be needing this value to check if any magnification of the demand displacement is required. Afterwards, we can then start defining our pushover global control settings. We can do this under the pushover tab and clicking on global control. With the pushover global control window, there are a number of settings that we can modify. First, we can tell the software if we want it to consider geometric nonlinearity due to large displacements for our pushover analysis. Next, we can also tell the software if we want it to 
perform nonlinear static analysis for our initial loads, or do we just want to import the static analysis results for our pushover analysis? We can also define the default stiffness reduction ratios for the trilinear and bilinear skeleton curve. Additionally, we can also instruct the software on how it will consider our point spring supports and our elastic links. Afterwards, we will need to define our pushover load cases. To do this, under the pushover tab, click on load case. Clicking on add will give us the following settings. So let's say I want to add a pushover load case in the X direction. So I will put the name for the load case as load X. I will leave the increment steps as 20 and I will consider P delta effects. I would also like my analysis to use the initial loads. The pushover load case can either be load controlled or displacement controlled. In this case, I want to use displacement control. Under displacement control, we are given the following options. I can select global and input a max translational displacement for the structure wherein I want my pushover analysis to stop. I can also select a master node and indicate a max displacement for that node. For this case, I will be inputting node 2005 as my node of interest. Direction would still be dx and I would input an arbitrary value that is higher than my demand displacement. In this case, I will put 0.8 meters. I will then select a load pattern that I want for my pushover load case. For the load patterns, we have the following options. We can use a static load case. We can use uniform acceleration, mode shapes, and the normalized mode shape multiplied by the mass. For this case, I've already created a static load case, which I want to be the pattern for this pushover analysis. So clicking on add and click on OK, we have our load X pushover load case. If I also want to have a pushover load case in the Y direction, I will just have to repeat the previous steps. Note that direction must be set to DY. And select your load pattern related to the Y direction. Afterwards, we can then define our hinges. We can define our hinges under the pushover tab, hinge properties, and define pushover hinge properties. Clicking on add will give us the following options. But for this presentation, I would like to show you how you can integrate the use of the Midas General Section Designer or GSD in your pushover analysis problems. You can access Midas General Section Designer under the Tools tab and clicking on General Section Designer. And initially, we will have to link this General Section Designer to our Midas Civil Model. So we just have to click this icon and connect with our Midas Civil software. So I will be showing on how you can use Midas GSD to define your hinges for your pushover analysis. So let me just open a file that I've prepared in advance. Midas Civil will be needing your inelastic material properties. In this case, let's see the settings and values that I've prepared for my concrete material. The usual values in seen in Midas Civil is also located here, as well as our nonlinear properties. We have the following options for our hysteresis model. In this case, I will be using the Mander model. And I've already input the values in advance. Moving on, I will be defining my rebar material properties. So for this case, I am using the park strain hardening hysteresis model.
Afterwards, I can define the settings for my confined concrete properties under the Demander model. Clicking on the stress strain curve button will show us the stress strain curve for both the unconfined and confined concrete. When all required inputs have already been satisfied, we can start on getting the moment curvature curve. To do this, we go under design and click on design section. After analysis, we can go to the moment curvature curve tab. So here, you will have to input the values that are prescribed in your design code. Clicking on Apply will create the moment curvature curve. Here, we can inspect the results of our moment curvature curve. We can also check the points and create a report. And most importantly, export the data back to Midas Civil. After we've exported the hinges, we can just simply assign them to their respective elements. Next, we can then perform pushover analysis. First, we have to make sure that the linear perform analysis has been completed. And for just for good measure, let me just increase the number of increment steps from 20 to 200. And now we can perform pushover analysis. And now I'll just quickly show you on how you can interpret your pushover analysis results. Under the pushover tab, you can check your reactions, deformations, forces, stresses, and your hinge status results. Note that these are different from the results under the results tab because these pushover results are tied to specific steps in your analysis. So, Here's a quick example on how you can use these tools to interpret your results. For example, you want to know your deformations at the moment of your first yield. So click on the hinge status result. These are the types of results that are available to us. So I will use FEMA. The component would be RY. And let me just check on legend. And when we click apply, there are no yielding elements yet because we are still at step one. So you can just click anywhere here to jump to any specific step. So here we see that a hinge has already formed at the bottom of our column. So moving up the steps. We know that the first yielding has started in step 27. Knowing the step of first yielding, we can go to our deformations results, go directly to step 27, and then we can see the deformations at the step where a hinge has occurred. After your analysis, here are some final points that you may consider. First is, you have to check if there are any ductility or rotational requirements in the design code that you are using. Next, you have to ensure that there is sufficient capacity for the other elements. And lastly, do not use too much of the plastic region. In one of the projects that I've previously been involved with, we usually multiply the demand displacement by around 20% to take into account any possible uncertainties. Now I'll just like to show you some of the references that I've used for this presentation. And that concludes my presentation. And thank you for listening. All right, I think that's it for our webinar. 
I think it was a very good opportunity to get to know about plastic engine and pushover analysis. I'm sure the audience have learned a lot. If there is anybody who didn't get a chance to ask questions during the session, feel free to email us at MidasBridge at MidasIT.com. And for those of you who didn't get the answers for your questions during the session, we'll send you the follow-up email for that. Also, like I said earlier, we'll send out the recorded webinar and PPT file to your email. So thank you everyone who came today and have a good evening.